Well, welcome to all of you. It's a great pleasure for me, even though I sort of had to race on my bicycle across campus to do it, and I'll have to be racing back and leave you a little early. But um, in any case, it's a pleasure for me tonight uh, to be able to uh, stand between you and the, the good program long enough to introduce David Carrasco, who needs no introduction, uh, and, but simply also to say how delighted and happy I am that uh, Sheri Moraga uh, could be with us uh, for really more than, more than just the evening. Also tomorrow morning, I think she'll be meeting with students. And I think this is an opportunity that's uh, a real windfall for us. And I want to thank David uh, particularly for making this happen. Uh, he, uh, he, he did it uh, late and managed to pull it off. So uh, I'm really, I really think that's an accomplishment. David is, of course, our Neil L. Rudenstein, a professor of the study of Latin America. Uh, both here and in the Department of Anthropology, uh, a longtime friend and colleague. It's always a great pleasure to have him uh, handling any program because we know it's going to be exciting. Uh, so without further ado, because as I, all, of you, all of you know David well, uh, I'm going to hand it over to him for the major introduction of the night. David, thank you again. So let's see, I'm not used to speaking in here with these fans. Can you hear okay? It's all right? It's all right? Yeah, okay, 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 good. So I want to thank you all for coming. I think we have some students here who are from beyond the Divinity School, and I want to make sure that those students who've come from other schools feel very welcome to be with us this afternoon. Uh, as part of the very special visit that we have. I've asked uh, Maria Cristina Vlasidis to welcome Sherry Moraga and all of you by constructing one of her um, very valued and beautiful and meaningful altars. And uh, just as a, a way of sort of ceremonially um, introducing the event, I'd like uh, Maria Cristina to come up and say a few words about this altar. And then I will uh, bring uh, Sherry Moraga to you. Gracias, profe. Bienvenidas y bienvenidos. Welcome, everyone. As always, there are more people in the room than we can count. We have the spirits of our ancestors and in honor of our ancestors that continue to inspire us, people that have provided light when we had no hope people who were tender and welcoming and provided hospitality when we were homeless, people who wrote books and poems and short stories that reflected what we never dared to say, lo que nunca pasó por nuestros labios. We'll take a moment to honor our own strength, our own courage, our own voices, in always striving to shape a more loving and just world. This is uh, a gift for this school, for the students, for our leaders and counselors and guides and our special guest, Sheri Moraga, who is one of our hermanas that Tiene palabra, and in our Latino, Latina culture, ser una persona de palabra is very valued. To be a person of your word and maintain your word, and not only the written word, but also that word, providing hope, especially in difficult times. And so this little altar also symbolizes what she reminded me of the missing piece when she and Professor Carrasco went to witness the unearthing of this colossal goddess, what she noticed first was not what was there, was not the obvious, was not what our mortal eyes could see. She noticed the piece that was missing near the naval area and how telling and how profound and how deeply that touched me, that she had the vision to give importance to the silence, 
to the invisible, to the not there. And in many ways, here at Harvard Divinity School, as scholars, as students, as aspiring teachers, we are challenged each and every time to see what is not there, to think about what is missing. And so today, in honor of all our missing pieces and all our courage to bring those missing pieces back together with the solidarity that community brings, may you have a productive learning journey with our inspiration, Cheri Moraga. Gracias. So I want to thank uh, Dean William Graham for being here this evening. He has a busy schedule. He's going to be going off to another event, a prior commitment. But I think that those of us who are uh, uh, here tonight to give <coughs> acknowledgement to uh, this, what I call the Latino Primavera, this Latino springtime, which is taking place at our school and around the country, we can be grateful to uh, Dean Graham because uh, I remember this school <laughs> when I first came before he became the dean. Uh, and it's really, it's really changed uh, in the right direction. And those changes uh, are in part due to his leadership, uh, to the openness and the kind of creativity and the persistence that he brings to these, um, these initiatives. Um, uh, I, I don't think we could have done better in these years uh, with a different dean. I think he's done a marvelous job. We're really grateful to you. And I'd like to have you give him a round of applause for the kind of support he's given us. <laughs> At last spring's Latino graduation, uh, which I spoke at, I talked about what I perceived as taking place in the Divinity School and in other schools, and that is this Latina, Latino primavera, this Latino springtime, where there is cause for hope and there is cause for new plantings and new kinds of fruits that are appearing in our midst. I said this in part because our school has been blessed with the arrival of two Latina professors. And uh, it was uh, my hope that uh, we could have an event uh, that would acknowledge their arrival, as well as the arrival of other new faculty to our school. Our two brilliant colleagues who have joined us, Aisha Beliso de Jesus is here. Please stand up. Aisha is here. <laughs> Followed by Myra Rivera Rivera. Myra Rivera Rivera. <laughs> and today's event in part is to celebrate them and to say we're grateful that you have come. Uh, we are pleased with the gifts that you have brought to us. We already notice in the comments that students are making that you are making a positive impact. One student said to me the other day, I'm studying with Professor Myra Rivera Rivera. And he said, I think she's the first real theologian I've studied with at the Divinity School. <laughs> Someone came in to see me last week and said, I'm taking a class with Professor De Jesus. She's awesome. <laughs> So this Primavera is here, I think. It's also taking place nationally. There are signs and there are sounds that Latino peoples, that people in the communities, you know now they estimate there's 52 million Latinos in the United States. And they're breaking through in the arts, in business, in leadership, in sports, in music. They're having a, a deep and wide impact you know that the Latinos in this country have a trillion dollar earning power now? Do you know that Univision, the Spanish speaking station, outdrew all of the English speaking stations last month in the 18 to 49 uh, age group? More people watched Univision in that age group in Spanish than watched all of the other English speaking stations. That's a sign that there's some kind of primavera taking place. I just came from Washington, D.C., where I uh, yesterday had a chance uh, to go to the Supreme Court to meet uh, Sonia Sotomayor 
and also speak to the Corporation of Public Broadcasting uh, with the theme that they had me speak on to us on Latinos in the media. And uh, I heard uh, Carlos Arce, one of the great demographers in the United States today, speak, and he gave this tremendous presentation on the demographic changes that are taking place linguistically, taking place uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of women uh, and their participation, Latina women and their participation. Um, and uh, he used this phrase I hadn't heard before, ambicultural, from ambidextrous, but ambicultural, that Latinos are ambicultural. Um, uh, and it was clear to me that in spite of the negative stories that we see all the time about immigration, and especially immigrants from Mexico, that there are signs and sounds of the Latino primavera. One of the things that really impressed me yesterday when we went to meet Sonia Sotomayor, this was arranged by a, a student here in the Kennedy School. Uh, we went to uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, we went to see Sonia and um, Sotomayor. And um, it was a marvelous experience to be in her chambers with this group of Latinos and Latinas and to spend this time with her. Uh, and she said a couple things that really, really impressed me, that gave me a sense of this, this idea of this, this springtime. She said, you know, when I was uh, chosen for the court, I was concerned that, you know, since we have one black, that now we'll have one Latina. And uh, it'll all be seen as affirmative action. She said, why can't we have two blacks or two Latinas or more on the Supreme Court? She said, we've got to fight against that. People trying to just put us in a pipeline and just make us add-ons. She's got to figure a way around it. And she said, one of the things I've done in my career, in my life, is that whenever I identified a weakness in myself, I threw myself into overcoming it. And she said, that's what Latinos and Latinas have to do, because they're going to always be hearing about weaknesses in themselves. And what you've got to do is not just complain about it, but throw yourself, as Sherry Moraga has done, into these challenges that we're going to constantly be getting from enemies and sometimes our friends. When I was at the uh, Corporation of Public Broadcasting, uh, it was an amazing experience to be there with so many of these station managers from around the country, many of them who knew Sherry Moraga's work, and to see that there is an invigorated commitment um, uh, to have more programming about Latinos, by Latinos and Latinas. And I thought in the spring, and I think now, the best person to help us mark this primavera is Sherry Moraga. Because Sherry Moraga is a critical thinker, but she's also a poet. I know that there's a new interest here in the school to have poetry. We have courses on poetry. We have people getting together on poetry. Well, here we have a poet. But one thing that she also brings besides the poetry is she brings the plays. And we could do more with drama and theater here at the Divinity School. I know we're doing something. And we're hoping that this visit by Sherry Moraga can be the first of several visits where we might be able to have her back to do a play, to one of her plays, actually stage it here at Harvard. Now, wouldn't that be a springtime for Harvard? I first um, met Sherry Moraga in a coffee shop at Stanford University where I was visiting. Maria Luisa and I were visiting Stanford and we had this student, a student in common. And he said, hey man, you know who teaches here? I said, who? He said, Sherry Moraga. I said, I said, nobody ever told me that she teaches at Stanford, where she is the artist in residence. He said, oh yeah, man. He said, her classes are the bomb. <laughs> he said, you got to, you got I said, man, I didn't know Sherry was here. Let me meet her. So we arranged to meet and we met at this coffee shop. And... Um, you know, I walked away from the coffee shop feeling like, you know, not only had I met this person whose work I admired, but I, I really felt that something was alive in the Chicano community, in the Chicana community, at, even at Stanford, which I didn't know was still alive. She invited me to her class, 
I spoke in her class. I showed her the mapa, the Kuautin Chan. And you know about the mapa, the Kuautin Chan. Many of you do. This pre columbia this uh, early colonial indigenous map. And she really got into this map. And she started to imagine a new play, a new kind of way of conceiving the meaning of this map. And she wanted to, to also think about the goddesses. And so I said, well, Cherie, why don't you come to Mexico City when Maria Luisa and I are there, and I'll show you the goddesses. And so she came in August, and we spent some time in Mexico City visiting the Aztec goddesses. And um, it was just a marvelous experience to, to be there and get a sense not only of the living power of these Aztec goddesses, Coyoshauki, the moon goddess, and Tlatecutli, the earth goddess, but also to see how she began to to react and to respond and to think about this. And we hope that we can work together in the future. She really started to become uh, very well known and famous when she was the co-editor of the book called This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color, which won the Before Columbus American Book Award in 1986. She's the author of the now classic, and listen to these titles, Loving in the War Years, Lo Que Nunca Pasó Por Sus Labios, and also a book called The Last Generation, published by a press right here in Cambridge. She published a, more, a memoir on motherhood entitled Waiting in the Wings, and she's completing a memoir on the subject of Mexican-American cultural amnesia, entitled Send Them Flying Home a geography of remembrance. And you're gonna be pleased to know that she's completed a new collection of writings which is coming out from Duke University this year, early next year, called A Chicana Codex of Changing Consciousness, A Decade of Discourse. I can go through uh, all of these wonderful things that she's done. Uh, she's had a number of plays that have uh, garnered a tremendous response and deep appreciation um, in 2005, her play, The Hungry Woman, a Mexican media, opened at the Peugeot Theater at Stanford University. In the years following, she delivered other works, including The Mathematics of Love, Digging Up the Dirt, and something that still gets new titles every once in a while, La Semilla Caminante, The Traveling Seed. On July 30th, 2010, her Digging Up the Dirt opened to a sold out audience and a five week run at the Breath of Fire Latina Theater in Orange County. When we were preparing ourselves for her visit, I wrote a little comment for the Anuncio that you've seen. And uh, I was inspired to say that when Gloria Saldua passed away, Many of us felt that there had been an eclipse of the moon. But Sheri Moraga is with us, and she brings the rays of the primavera. And we want to welcome her here today. She's come all the way across the country from that other great university, Stanford. So please join me in welcoming Sheri Moraga in a very Latina way. <laughs> Sheri Moraga. Well, uh, to begin with, I want to thank my doctor, my doctora. <laughs> I have a really bad cold. As you can see, I've been well provided for, and uh, I appreciate it. So you're going to get my lower register today. I hope you like it. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for all of those words of introduction. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Um, I, th I think I would prefer, though, to say that I came all the way from Oakland, California, and not Stanford. 
um, with all due respect. But if you're talking about eclipses, Oakland eclipses Stanford. Depending on your point of view, verdad? Anyway. There's a lot of things that I, I would like to talk about today, and um, it's always interesting to start to think about uh, the title of a work, and uh, I decided A Small Nation of Remember. It's uh, the last line of uh, some excerpts of a, of, of a play you'll see, La, uh, La Semilla Caminante. It's the last line, and it's one of my favorite lines a small nation of remember. And um, what I would like to do today is I want to, I'm going to um, speak a little bit. I'm going to read from a couple of pieces that have to do with this theme of remembering what that has to do with spirit, what that has to do with our bodies. Um, then I would like to show um, some excerpts of a couple of uh, plays, uh, The Hungry Woman and La Semilla Caminante because they come the closest, I think, to really sort of looking at structures of storytelling that I feel come closer to something that might be us. Uh, I say us so that all of you can get a chance to stand in that us, okay? That might be us. Now, everybody in this room's got some place where they feel in us. Well, probably in this room more so than in other rooms. Because sometimes the us implies a them. Well, and I know I'm supposed to be beyond that, but I'm not. I still, in many ways, do this little trick. At 58 years old, it was my birthday a couple days ago. I do this little trick which somehow I try to figure out how to know that ultimately, as my um, Buddhist friends tell me, um, the absolute truth is that we're all connected. I believe that to my core. But I also know the road to that connection is oftentimes war, unfortunately. And I'm not talking about bang, bang, although unfortunately that, that happens. But war in the sense of uh, a kind of, of course, spiritual warriorship, where um, there has to be a kind in order to find, if you are a disenfranchised people, wherever that lines up for you, as people of color, as indigenous, as queer people, wherever that lines up for you. In order to stand in that position and make room for that position, since there is not an equal playing field, you have to, on some level, carve that space out. And the act of carving um, can sometimes really feel like there's a them. Verdad? Everybody's with me, right? Okay. I say that because it seems so um, uh, rudimentary as almost not to be necessary to talk about, but in these times, I'm afraid. Um, I'm afraid of language in the academy um, that tends to um, mask those questions of difference. Um, I do teach at Stanford. I've been there many years. And as I always say, it's a really good gig. And I am ever grateful for what a ruling class university can give me. Because that's what it is, as this place is. Which is the freedom to write. So I'm grateful. But I'm as grateful to the Mexicanos that work in the, the cafeteria there, making my focaccio sandwich, you know, as I am to the 
uh, guy who writes the check, the funders, right? Because the funding couldn't happen without the Mexicano workers. It's all connected, and I try to remind my Chicano students that they don't owe Stanford anything. They earn their right to be there. And if they have questions about their right to be there, then go to the cafeteria and see who's serving the food and remember that your familias made this possible to this day with their labor. It seems so obvious as not to be worth mentioning, but of course it's the most invisible of all things. So there's an, there is an us and a them. But more profoundly what I'm interested in is not having conversations so much about them. Because if one spends one's time in conversation about them, you never get to your own business. You know, that's why early on when this bridge called my back came out and it was very popular very quickly in the early 80s, I suddenly went from being a nobody to a somebody and uh, everybody wanted me to go and talk about racism. I didn't want to talk about racism. I wanted to talk about women of color. If you talk about racism, then you're, I'm happy to talk about internalized colonization, the effects those things have on people of color. But if you're talking about racism, then you're talking about them. Hmm? So, so all of that kind of early consciousness that I, that I developed within a community of people, not alone, has evolved into, ironically, more and more specificity. And the specificity, and this comes, this is particularly important as an artist, <coughs> because it is only the degree to which you are specific that you can then communicate the human experience. So my job as a Chicana is to look at every strand of what that might mean. Everything it means about to be female in a Chicana body, everything about our herencia, our history, our tradiciones, our cuentos, our mitos, everything. As much as it also is also in that female body and that queer body, all of those components come together. The more specific, maybe, just maybe, the more specific I am in the exploration of those things, maybe there's a possibility for a human interaction between us. Otherwise, if I write for them, I write in translation, and they never really get to know me. And the us never get to have us, because I'm busy writing for them. I know I'm only using monosyllabic words so far <laughs> in this whole, in this whole, what I'm saying, us, them, us, them, but it's as simple as that. It is as simple as that. If you spend your time worrying about them, you'll never get to your real work. Mm -hmm. I always love when I take all my notes and I end up talking about something completely different than what I planned, but <laughs> that's all part of it. But this is a small nation of, of remembrance, so this is why it's a small nation. It's a small nation because in my nation, I'm still not convinced my people want to remember. How many of you think that about your own nations? Raise your hand. Okay. Think about it. Of course, we have to figure out what remember means. Remember what? And I'm not, and in a certain way, you know, I, there's always, la language is so dangerous. But you know, a certain way, you know, language like post-traumatic stress syndrome really works. Because if you think of colonization as stress, <laughs> and you think of it as trauma, well, there we are. So the whole thing about post-traumatic stress is that you try to get the people to remember what they don't want to remember, right, in order to get over it and to go on. <coughs> That's what a people have to do, too. But not to get over it, to get through it. 
to re to create um, beauty out of those remembrances. So partly um, my concern is then, and what where my road has kind of gone in that specificity. Mm. is to look at my herencia, when, uh, when David was talking about our meeting in Stanford, one of the things that struck me above all else is that um, it was almost his um, naivete in the sentence, which I totally related to, is when he said, man, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I thought, man, when I was studying all this Mesoamerican stuff, man, I thought everybody was going to figure out this was the American, this was it. This was, this was the American literature. And of course it is. It's indigenous American literature. And so he was just waiting, you know, for everybody to figure out this great thing, you know. And I loved it because that's that um, optimism of youth, you know. I mean, you really think it's a good thing, and he's right. And what a different place it would be if we had looked at this country, this land base, and uh, these Americas, and what it had to teach us. So um, that's my job then. I'm gonna do what David wanted. And the beauty of meeting him was that I, you know, I found a brother who was uh, interested in that, who saw that, who could see that reflected. So, Partly what it's meant is for me um, to go backward. I always have to, um, you know, I think that always, you know, the person is political and what I always need to honor is that in my good life, in my very blessed life, which has been full of great obstacles, I have also had found great partnership and uh, have not been alone in my pursuits so I can wake up in the morning and I look across the breakfast table and I see somebody who doesn't think I'm crazy. And more than that, who is on many levels really, as a visual artist, I'm talking about my partner, Celia Herrero Rodriguez, as a um, visual artist, um, sees things like, you know, I'm like all words, you know. And, um, and, and also certain traditions within our Herencia um, came to me through this hard road of walking with her. Um, I always like to acknowledge that because um, it's really hard to do it alone because if you're alone, you feel a little bit crazy. So, <clears throat> and one of the things that people make you feel crazy about is that to go backwards is to be backwards. Right? That's how people see things. That's what this country's built on. Invention, progress, capital, competition, individualism. There's a place for those things. But you know as well as I do, and the reason why you have pouring rain any minute now here in this balmy August weather in, you know, October is because of all those things, right? You're making these connections. I hope I don't have to explain <laughs> what I mean by that. So, so, um, so the going backwards is to be backwards. Going backwards is to be essentialist. Going backwards is to be nostalgic. This is all the language of the academy, of any work that you might be doing that's related to indigenous thought that's not anthropological. 
So to look at indigenous thought, an indigenous point of view, as something that might actually <clears throat> uh, change your life in a way, and I'm not talking about appropriation here, uh, language is so bad, again, I have to say. But what I'm talking about is there something that has been forgotten along the way. That if you could return to your own traditions, that there might be some blueprints in there. Again, terrible metaphor, but a blueprint in there, a map, better, mapa, for you to find your way home. In other words, to make family, to make community, <coughs> to make good work, to live in a reciprocal relationship to the rest of the planet. I'm not talking about any easy, new age, Native American ceremonial circles. I don't want to talk them. I want to talk us, which means about I cannot say for any of you, how do you go home? I'm just telling you how I'm still trying to figure out at 58 how to go home. And in that process, maybe that specificity can show you something, can open a little causeway for you somewhere. That would be a great thing. I would be happy with that. And I am happy in my life because once in a while, I think my words do that. That's a great thing. So partly, one of the things to be considered is how do we know? Um, there's a line in uh, some of the stuff that I'm, I'm going to quote from today. It comes from this collection of essays over these last 10 years. And one of the one line that I wrote that my students love all the time, so I, I don't think it's mine anymore. I think it's out there in the world. But it's like, you know more than you know, you know. This is a good line, no? You know more than you know, you know. You know more than you know, you know. You think you don't know because how you came to know or what you may have inherited as a way of knowing has for the most part been lost to you. So you've inherited along the way other ways of knowing which are also are valuable. So you think that's all you know. So in, me, in my case, if I grew up in a home, which I did, that did not have books around it, you can spend the whole rest of your life thinking you don't know anything. Or once you started reading, you're always doing catch-up. And you'll never read as much as the people that grew up with books in their house because they're born into knowing. My son has a vocabulary that's off the hook. That's because he sits at dinner table with me and my partner among all our slew of friends who have vocabularies off the hook. I didn't have the vocabulary. He has it. I don't know what he's going to do with it. But he was born with much more access than me. So I thought I didn't know. But I knew more than I knew I knew. But I had to go back to know what I had forgotten. So as an artist, what that means is that it's not just your chronology. And that's where spirit comes in. <coughs> because in order to find out what you know, you have to take this pitiful thing called your ego, put it aside, and see what passes through you. That's why people Well, I was going to say the first thing, that I was going to say that's why people go to church. But I mean church in the best sense of that word. I don't mean institutionalized religion I'm talking about, but that's why still the intention. Why do we go to church? So we can be a we, <coughs> not an I. So we can let go. And I'm not talking about the Christian model. I'm talking about this, uh, the, you know, what, you know, even, you know, Catholics, I remember, like the mystical body of Christ. Did you ever see those pictures? I don't know if they do that anymore, but when I was a kid, they had these pictures of the mystical body of Christ. 
And as Catholics, of course, we were it, right? We were the most important. <laughs> so, um, so there's millions of people, little tiny, tiny people in this mystical body of Christ. And you were one of those little mystical people, one of the little people in there. You were a member of the church. Ay, que bueno, right? What comfort, right? And so that's what we all want. We want just comfort, right? So I'm not talking about that. But it still has the same human need, the same, same human want, which is we really do want to give up our egos because our egos make us stupid. They're very good to function. They're incredibly good to function. They're what got me up out of bed when I was feeling really sick this morning. I got up and I got to work because my, my ego would kill me if I couldn't come here. Right? So that's a good thing. It's a good survival thing. But fundamentally, our deepest sights of knowing are generated in when we are able to access spirit. And how we access spirit comes through the body. Punto final. Okay. One of the biggest lies, and we all know this, and it's silly to even say it, but one of the biggest lies of the Western world is that spirit don't come through the body. It comes through the body. The reason why people go to ceremony is because, and why you say, I'm going to use some of the ceremonies I know the best, why you sit up in a medicine ceremony, and you'll see some of that right now, to get well. You sit up all night, and it hurts, and you feel sick, and you know, because your body is giving you a mirror of how pathetic your pitiful mind is. Because what does our little mind go, right? I mean, you know, and it's, you know, it's all true, it's all real. But our biggest self, our best self, the part, the place where I could throw my ego out, and I see you as hermano. No judge, I see you, hermano. <coughs> Cannot happen if the ego's there. So you can sit up and say, oh, my God, oh, look at her. Oh, look at her with Bailey. Oh, I must have cost her a lot of money. Oh, and then, you know, you could do all of that, you know. I'm sure people do it all the time. But damn, it's too, it's too hard to suffer that much, you know, and not let go. So, <coughs> but the other way I understand how to do that is why people do go to ceremony, but how do you access spirit? We access spirit through nature. You know, and you may hate nature. You know, <laughs> it's like not everybody's for the forest and all that, you know. You access spirit by a smell. Spirit catches you off guard. Spirit is intuitive. Spirit happens through the senses. The sister is building that altar because in the physical act, whether you see it or you don't see it, but for her, lucky her, in the physical act of paying attention to putting each object down, she has left her ego behind. Not that she may not struggle with, and I don't mean you personally, but one doesn't struggle with, oh, well, I hope they like it or I hope that, it, you know. We all, I mean, that's how we are. And the pitiful part is just go, oh, God, that's so pitiful. We go on. You know what I'm saying? But when, if we're lucky and if we're paying attention, those physical actions will put her in a different side of knowing. And she will be changed by that experience. So when she leaves here, she will interact with the world just a little bit differently. The other way we understand spirit, I mean, spirit comes to us in many, many ways. For me as a writer, and this is probably what I wanted to talk about, for me as a writer, spirit has to come through in terms of looking at ceremony. I mean, looking at writing, the practice of writing as ceremony. <coughs> in other words, my head is not the only thing operating when I'm writing. It's the body. So, and this is for all you people writing your dissertations, which is not a very good example, but, so when you're writing and you feel your gut tightening, that's something to pay attention to. Your body is telling you something, and it's probably telling you what you already know anyway. 
which is oh my god you know it's like how am i gonna have how am i gonna get through that's the in a really you know the ego is really important um thank you <coughs> the ego is really important to, to write a dissertation it really is you know it helps you get through it you know but when you go to write the book start to really pay attention to what your body is doing as you write if you're bored when you're writing you're writing boring stuff you know if you're engaged you're engaged um, I've taught years uh, so many years creative writing and have found that um, you know and, and because also over the years I've taught a lot of women and uh, and do you know a lot of memory work to people doing their writing and so many women you know have experienced incest and violence at home boys too you know so somebody will be they write and you know and they and saw this all you know they've been violated and they talk about it and everything you know and I always try to tell them that writing creative writing classes are not therapy you might feel better after it but they're not therapy so I say like this I go tell me the color of the sheets and then they look at me like, you know, God, I thought you were a feminist. Here I wrote all this really, you know, hard stuff about incest, et cetera, and you tell me, you tell me the color of the sheets. I said, yeah. Because if you don't tell me what he smelled like and what the color of the sheets were, your body didn't write it. And if your body didn't write it, my body can't read it. If my body can't read it, I'll never be changed. And guess what? You'll never be changed by the writing. Which, of course, then gets us to the question of healing. Again, I hate that word. There's something about our language that words get so ripped off so quickly and used so horribly. Everybody's a healer and everything, you know. It's like almost like, it's like I stopped using sacred. I stopped using heal. You know, and I don't. I use them, of course. But I always have to say I hate that word. Because it's, you know, so you try to think of really bad words, you know, like contrary words, like nation. Oh, it's such a contrary word. No one likes that word. And we're not, because we're not, because, you know, you're talking about nationalism. You know, we're not talking about patriotism. You know, it's all that tribal stuff. Tribe's a dirty word, you know. So, so the language stuff is very important. But, but it, it, of course, the essence of what we're talking about here is healing, you know. One does do work, one imagines, and I'm still feminist enough and have never quite made it in New York enough to say that still my intention as a writer and I credit coming up as a writer through movement, that my intention is to heal. As naive as I might be. So, so that process then involves <coughs> memory. And it also involves us trying to figure out how to access other ways of knowing. Um, and it is by, through memory then, that we create a future. Um, Eduardo Galliano said this, God, I wish I could find that quote a long time ago where he had wrote this in some magazine article and I just thought it was so amazing, you know. You know, he say just, you know, and because he, you know, he has done all those books about history, right? You know, the whole, you know, 500 years, you know, only he <laughs> would decide he's going to write 500 years of, you know, colonization in his trilogy. And he says, God, he did it because if you don't write it, it's, you know, as I always say, it repeats itself, but it's worse than that. You know, if you don't write it, there is no future. You know, and what's particularly scary now, and then you know, David had mentioned the thing about me writing this book about cultural amnesia, is that it's really, really scary is the rate of forgetting now in our culture. It is terrifying. <coughs> so for me, partly the ways in which to begin to access that memory, of course, has taken me to some, some um, maybe not so obvious choices, but one of them has been to look at ceremony, to participate in ceremony, to try to figure out how to make art like ceremony. And my work in theater, of course, um, is so um, important in this regard because the beautiful thing about 
having, you know, our tradition is an oral tradition. Again, that's something that's been said a million times before. But until you really write a story that can't work unless somebody's body says it, you don't get oral tradition. So for me as a writer, I write everything, even my essays out loud. I mean, I write them first in my head. You know, I write them like this, and, 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 but then when I'm rewriting, I write everything out, out, I say everything out loud. If my mouth can't do it, it's not, a right, it's not right. Because there's no body. And if I, as a writer, am asking your body to be with me in the reading, then my body better have been there in the telling. So the beautiful thing about teatro, of course, is that those of us particularly who grew up in oral traditions can write it down, and then the actor makes it, puts it back into a body. That is hot. I mean, that is just, you know, when they're terrible actors, it's a horrible experience. <laughs> but when they're good, oh, it is the most beautiful thing. And, and along that path, then, it's really gotten me into now doing a lot more directing of my work as well, for that reason. OK. So I think what I'd like to do, since I follow none of my notes in the way I was going to do it, I think I want to show you um, a couple of clips of things. I think I'll just show the, the first, um, and then I want to talk about it. How long are we in here? No, <laughs> no I just want to watch the clock. OK. So um, the first piece he's going to show you is, um, and we'll just do one of the, the Hungry Woman, the first one, is the, uh, the Hungry Woman of Mexican Medea. And in this piece, one of the things that became really important to me, and I've been collaborating for some time um, uh, as with an actor, director, Adelina Anthony, who's wonderful. Some of you um, might know her. She's a wonderful solo performer as well. So she directed this work with me. And, um, and also, I've begun this relationship and since around 2005, of beginning to work with Celia Herrera Rodriguez in terms of design. And she is somebody who's really studied much more than I have on a certain level, the, the symbologies, et cetera, of... Uh, uh, not only Mesoamerican traditions, but also the traditions of the North. And one of the things that will be more evident in La Semilla Caminante is that as Chicanos, in terms of looking at indigenous practice, we really do blend the North and the South. You know, those of you there that, that walk that red road um, know that you know, one minute you might be in a peyote ceremony and the, that following weekend you went to a temescal or a, you know, a sweat lodge, which is a Northern tradition. And, and peyote is from the south, even though the north thinks now it's theirs. But it really did come from Mexicanos, um, from the Huichol. Um, so so uh, in this particular piece, what I would like you to kind of look at is that the, the piece has been, um, it basically, there's a kind of a corollary in my work between everything, not kind of, it's like absolutely inter, intertwined. The work that I write, in terms of creative nonfiction, is integral to the work I do in theater and back and forth. The great thing about theater is that since you're working with characters, they can contradict themselves, they can be bad guys, you know, they don't have to be heroic. You know, I think still, you know, we all have enough ego that when I'm writing creative nonfiction, it's like, you know, I still want to be heroic, you know. Even if you're telling, you know, things that are really hard to tell, still you want to come up looking okay. You know, but the great thing about theater is that you don't have to. You know that the characters can enact conflict, so you will see yourselves reflected, hopefully. Um, so in this particular work, um, some of you may be aware of an a essay I wrote some time ago uh, called uh, "Queer the, Refor the Reformation of Chicano Tribe," and um, I didn't see a lot of recognition going on, <laughs> but anyway, so that, but this essay was really, really critical to me because it really, I, I am, and, and sometimes um, I don't, sometimes I feel a little bit like a throwback because I really am still really, really interested in that slime. I really care about it. Not that I think we will rest the Southwest from the United States, but I really do believe in that idea of cultural um, sovereignty that we need. We have treasures worth preserving on our own right. You know? And so the ideas around Atlanta of having a nation of people still matter to me. And, uh, 
And it's interesting because I really feel like there is no contradiction in that to feminism. Although even some of my colegas, other Chicanas, you know, don't necessarily see that same connection. Um, and I think it's coming out of just an incredible misogyny um, from the Chicano movement um, around Chicano nationalism where women really didn't, didn't have a role in it. But I figured they, the guys don't get to have it. You know, it's my nation too. So, so my interest in it um, was really sort of to look at, you know, critiquing questions of Atzalan. And so <coughs> in this particular um, uh, piece you're going to see, it's just the very beginning of the play, um, I've uh, reconstructed an Atzalan. Well, actually what I did is I constructed an Atzalan that happened and then failed, and all the queers are um, uh, exiled from Atzalan. So you're going to see basically the story of this Mexican Medea, this woman Medea, who had been a revolutionary in, in the uh, movimiento, and uh, who's then exiled for her love of a woman. And of course she has a son, and you know what has to happen there, but, but really the play is very much a, a critique of patriarchal motherhood. And that's a whole other conversation we could have, you know, but I think it's an important one, which we really haven't had. <clears throat> um, but the key thing in here is that I want you to look at sort of the, and you'll see it in the beginning of the play, sort of how this play is framed. Um, Sally designed it to be kind of in a kiva, but the floor, if you check out the floor, the floor is Koil Shauki, um, her dismembered body. And so the action of the play then, although it's happening in the so-called future, is actually happening on the ground of the past, because the past isn't the past. And so, what's going on now, all you guys didn't know all that stuff about temporality and space and all of that, you know the past is not the past, right? We're remembering this. Mm -hmm. so, so, it takes place within that, within an indigenous, a Mexica indigenous point of view, right? So the actors, um, particularly the kind of the, the, the cast of sort of extras, not the main characters, are the Siwatateo, and those are the women, uh, the goddesses, who were, <coughs> they were made goddesses because they, they were considered warrior goddesses because they had died in childbirth. Um, so these figures play all these multiple roles, and you'll see them in their, you know, Siwatateo outfit, right? And then you see that one becomes a nurse, one, got, you know. And so the idea being that in fact we walk around with Siwatateo all the time with us, if we paid attention. You know, as my sister said here, that you know, people are here in this room. The idea of those warrior women, you know, fierce. And there's a whole, that's what I'm gonna talk about with Samia Caminante, just to also, it's gonna, it's gonna connect you to Samia Caminante where you're looking at all this negative, so-called negative imagery about these female goddesses from the Mexica or Aztec tradition. And you know it's an overlay. There's something else is underneath it, like you're you know, talking about that hole in the belly. Vesselia and I saw that hole in the belly and I, you know, at the, um, of the goddess uh, in, in Templo Mayor. And then I felt very silly and I said to David, I said, he goes, what do you think, what do you think? You know, and I, and I felt embarrassed. And so I said to him, well, you know, because Celia and I were standing on opposite sides of this gigantic, you know, figure. And we walk like this. She's on one end, I'm on the other. We walk in like this. And literally at the same time, we said, it's the hole. What happened is there's a center part in it that has been, that was lost, right, you know, when they excavated it. And it's her vientre, it's her womb. You know? So I say to him later that night, I just go, you know that, you know those um, stories you had to play as a kid, there's that little game you'd play and they'd show you a picture and they say, what's missing in the picture? Any of you guys ever play that? And you have to look, and then you flip the picture and you gotta see what's missing in it. So I said to him, I feel like that's been my life work, just what's missing in the picture. So, you know, Tatli Kutli, you know, she has this big old piece missing he goes, oh, great, that's great, that's great. That's why I brought you guys, man. That's what, you know, like, and, then, and, you know, and it's beautiful. Thank you, David. It's beautiful that someone 
doesn't look at you like you're nuts. That's a beautiful thing. I mean, you made my life better, you know? So, so, so what we're looking at here, you know, so these, these dioses, you know, they're fierce. I mean, you know, cut hair, ca- decapitation, you know, quite liquid and the, you know, snakes and hearts cut out. I mean, all of that stuff, they're fierce, you know. And, and in that, in that fierceness, you know, in that capacity for us to be afraid of the darkness, they're all about the dark. And that's where the moon resides. So, you know, I'm not saying that every woman, I'm not saying as in this in an essentialist way, but I am telling you that there is something in the feminine that has been so lost, and this is like, it seems so pathetic to say it because it's like, duh, but it's like it's been so lost, and these yoses somehow hold the key to something. And we already know that they were done during patriarchy, but it was close enough that these brothers are still doing scary images, you know what I mean? As opposed to, you know what I'm saying, right? So there's not, you know, so then it's gone for good. You know, give me, the, and they still couldn't beat the Llorona out of Guadalupe. You still got this woman screaming, right? So, so it, you can't, you can't con- completely eliminate that. But in this piece, so, uh, so that's going to come out in the second piece. When this, you'll, it's, it's about five minutes, and um, I just want you to kind of look at the images and the uh, the Koyoshauki <coughs> floor. Uh, the Suateteo figures who are going to be dancing in the beginning and the opening image of Cuatlicue. <coughs> okay, and I'll rest my voice. Hit it. Soviet Union collapsed, 1989. I didn't applaud it for fear of a rampant free market enslaving the globe, but it made revolution possible. If the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics could go, why not the United States of America? Why not? I had been a student of Marx, Engels, Malcolm X, Jerónimo, Che, and Fidel, a daughter of El Movimiento, the first one and last. We had redefined the movement, we women. The taste of desert bayuta became sweet upon my tongue. The medicine ceremonies north and south, the chanupa and the mezcal were the law of the land. Our dream of Aztlan would be realized in bloodshed. We were not Aztecs, but the inheritors of the Indian memory that carried that name. We went to war. We won and wrested the land from the land grabbers. Then lost ourselves to one another. I had seen it. The revolution I feared and hungered for in my lifetime. I could never have imagined I would also witness its demise.
the innocence of an eagle feather stuffed inside a mother's apron, the bird boy growing there, taking shape, the warrior son waiting in the wings, taking flight, so too begins and ends this story, the birth of a male child from the dark sea of Malaya at the dawning of an age. So I think you can take forward it up to that second one, then Jorge. Okay. Um, so the story that uh, she's telling, of course, is um, about, about the birth of Whistling the Pochley. I call him over to me. Mijito, I said. Yes, Chichi. We can't get rid of the sound. Oh, right there, well, now you get sneak previews. <laughs> I know you're supposed to do it by chapters, but their chapters never line up with the stuff I want to see. You know. Um, anyway, the birth of Weasley Pochley and, and uh, basically that, um, which is the story that uh, uh, he is born from Quatlique, who's the central figure you see there. I'm not going to go into talking about all of that, but except to say that that what's interplayed in this story is that you, in, in the play itself, is that you have this story happening in the, in the so-called real time, which begins where Medea is already in the hospital for the psychiatric hospital for the murder of her son. And so the play basically takes a week um, in, that, in that time, but a year to get her to the point of killing her son. And then it's happening also in terms of Mesoamerican time, where the ways in which many stories begin to impact um, the, the story of these people's lives. Um, so I think that, that um, I think it's gonna probably take a long time. So let's, <laughs> let's just look at, uh, I probably will just, I'm gonna do an extended thing. Let's just do an extended thing of Samia and I can talk better. Let's just do Samia. Take it from the beginning. And even though I won't be able to show you, or actually take it from, um, let me see. Take it into, uh, from the, the second clip, the six minute. Yeah, we'll just run it for a while. Um, so basically what I wanted to say about um, Semilla Caminante is a work that uh, matters a great deal to me. And what I'm, I'm hoping is that, that it's only been done in a workshop production. What I'm hoping is that it will, um, it is sort of the seed, if you will, for a bigger work that I want to do that's, um, that's also sort of dovetails with this MAPA journey that, um, David and I have been talking about, and he's collaborating with us as a dramaturg, which means he's a research guy. And um, so that I hope that means that we get to you know, tag along with him again when he goes to Mexico. 
and see, you know, see, get the backstage view of all these diosas. Um, but what's important um, to me about this particular work is that, and I'm going to read a section to you, and, and uh, I think uh, this will kind of set the framework for you. This is talking about my work in theater, and it begins. The stage is bare. Now, this is not La Semilla Caminante. This is my most, for my most recent play, Digging Up the Dirt. The stage is bare, except for several woven baskets. The music is Northern Mexican, Southwest Indígena, Antler, and Flauta. Amada enters. She's carrying a basket under one arm. She tosses dirt from it onto the ground. She wears a sarape in the style of a sweat dress. The poet digs at the earth with a shovel. It is a closing ritual as the two recall the ceremony offered to Amada upon her tragic passing. So they're discussing the ceremony that Amada has. And this character, Am Amada, is somebody who in the play was killed by her son. So it's sort of a flip of Medea. Amada asks the question about her ceremony. Was there a fire? Poet, between us, oh yes. No, I mean at the end. Poet, blazing. I built it myself. And into it, entregamos tus faldas, tus huipiles, tus joyas of silver and turquoise. Do you see it? You're honoring. And so she points to this fire on the stage, you know, done obviously with lights. A mother looks around. I don't. Poet, I am just trying to do something other than theirs on this stage. Amada, after a moment, yes, I see it. I, I picked this particular little quote that comes, it's very, it's at the end of Digging Up the Dirt, and um, because it really is all that I really care about right now, is trying to do something, I'm going back to the us and them again, trying to do something other than theirs on this stage. And when you see Samia Caminante, you'll get a sense of what I mean about that. Because what we've done is you've constructed a play that's basically as close to ceremony as you can get. Unfortunately, we can't show you all these pieces, but, but and, and by that is that your experience of ceremony is, is what you smell, it's what you taste, it's what you hear, it's what you see, it's all of the senses. So even in the, in the play itself, we had, um, a comal and on the comal, corn was being tossed in there. And we had the smell of sweet grass and all these, so, you know, so much for, it was the first time in my, my life where I wrote a play and nobody paid attention to my words. <laughs> and it was like, everybody's going, wow, those smells, they just transported me. And that was the best compliment. Because really and truly what it means is, is that people were having a visceral experience of what it was to be in this play. Also what the play was is that, it came about because we had gone on jornadas that Celia had directed and we met with various indigenous and immigrante communities um, and sat in ceremony with them. And so the play has an actual ceremony going on stage and also has these images of people in ceremony and, that, and some of our travels in that way so they're in correspondence with each other. But fundamentally what the play is about is it centers on the story of one woman, Vero, who's trying to get well back to the healing. Um, and so it really is her process of remembering. In this particular uh, uh, segment, of course, what she has to do is she has to remember acts of violence against her. And uh, there's a, a kind of a child's play segment um, about <coughs> the, a, a kind of a date rape that she experienced. It's not kind of a date rape um, of the man who was the father of her child. Um, so I kind of, I want you to look at sort of also, there's a cuentista who's telling the story as it's being enacted. So also the elements of storytelling, memory, and the music, they're all live musicians on stage. And um, so we'll just, I'll show you that segment and then um, I'll, I'll come and talk more, okay? So this is, um, also what you're gonna see is, uh, we'll have to do another clip, but we'll run it for a while and you'll see the Sitsini. Of bitter violence. 
Through the thick curtains of her black hair, she glimpsed their trembling mouths, inches from the dirt, backs bent and heaving. The best of roadmen would spot in Beno a seemingly endless capacity to hold the medicine inside. They continue to serve her, heaping spoonful of the thick, dirt green mush. It's a fight. Hours later, she finally began to gag at the taste of its greedy texture. <laughs> But would not let go. Show me the face of my name. She would pray all night, and all night faces would indeed appear like super eight film clips of Theoretica's career days. Distant figures with mouths wordlessly moving. But more often, and worse is when there were no images, just a formless dread rising up in her throat and then back down again, over and over, till it hardened into one great stone inside her gut. One night, so this is the, the, the coyote figure she knew to be her daughter's who is played by a woman, playing men. Average looking man, everything about him average. His weight hung loosely over hip hugger jeans, the obligatory rip in the kneecap, the arrogant slant of a black beret without the arrest record to back it up. There had been some kind of Puerto Rican rum. That much she remembered. That had been the lure, not him, but the liquor. It was a school night, and she snuck out, but there was no need since Mama Keta had been working the night shift at the fabrica that by then. Still, Vero knew better than to go off with someone so average, someone so less intelligent than she. She didn't care. There was the rum and the forgetting it would bring.
Okay, um, I want to show one more clip. So, um, Jorge, just go up to 4620. That's good enough, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the character I want to talk about is that this is, um, the coyote figure is a figure who in the very beginning of the play is very playful. And then that figure becomes, um, plays out all the roles of the rapist, the incest, I mean all the violations happen. And it's very intentional of course to cast a woman doing those roles. The coyote figure of course is somebody who can flip genders, flip all of it, and it has pr particular resonance I think around transgender stuff that we could also talk about if we had another two hours. And, um, but what's key is I wanted to bring it back to this figure of the tzitzime, because the tzitzime are um, probably the most uh, easiest way just to put it is that, um, again, they are female figures of the night, star people that come down in the night. And the idea is they come down in the night and from a kind of feminist interpretation is they come down in times of chaos but they come down in times of chaos to put things right again. That's how I want to see things. I know that uh, it's not just me alone thinking this way, right? That this is, that put things right again, is that without this female energy, and not the all, you know, kind, nice female energy, you know? But really what, it, what feminine means, and what darkness means, and the importance of darkness, that balance is so out, we're out of whack. So this figure comes in, the Tsitsime comes in at the beginning of the play, at the end of the play, and right here. And when Tsitsime comes in, same character who played Coyote, again, this is intentional. She comes in, and she's gonna help now Vero get well. But the point in which finally Vero is able to get well, which means to vomit up all of her pain, right, is the point in which she connects her individual pain to the pain that all women experience. And in this case, she uses the example of the women of Juarez uh, in, in terms of the femicide of these young women. So you'll see a grandmother figure come in and, and then we'll go through there and you'll see her um, being abused and then we're gonna end up and you watch the tzitzime and if it's not clear to you what she's doing when she's going like this to her, she's basically putting her finger down her throat to cause her to get well. Uh, not to be sick, but to get well. Okay.
520 girls and counting. I see my familia's dark side mirrored in the ponds of the dissolving black stones that are my mother's eyes. My daughters. Maybe I know and forget. Evana! Okay. So those are some of the images of uh, the people in the ceremony. They were just going. Nice. Sorry to lose me. Bless this. Um, so we have probably about 15 minutes to, if anybody has any questions or anything. I had more, much more things written here to say, but I would really like to hear from you and um, you know, we've said a lot of things already. Yeah, let, let, let me just say this, uh, which is a good time for you to have some questions and comments. Tomorrow morning, I forgot to say because I've just gotten off the plane, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in this room, we're going to have a panel discussion, a discussion with some panelists. Uh, uh, so uh, it's not just going to be a series of presentations, but um, uh, Professor De Jesus and Rivera Rivera will be here to give some responses. Uh, Susan Abrams is, is coming also, Abraham is coming as well, and we have two graduate students who are going to be, but, uh, and you're all welcome to come and participate in that, so for those of you who can, who are going to, this is a good time to, to raise questions and hear your comments. We're very interested in what you, what you think. Gracias, David. Don't be shy. Yes. Come on, um, I'm going to UMass on, <laughs> on two, I think it's, I'll be there Tuesday night at eight o'clock and I'm gonna do a lot of conversation about that. Um, but in a nutshell, I think what I'm kind of interested in, you know, is really looking at, um, you know, how, how our, my, my, our own culturas and indigenous cultures look at issues of 
transgenderism very distinct from the Western world. And um, I sort of bemoan that there hasn't been more explora exploration in that regard. So to me, that was having the coyote. I mean, the, the notion of a coyote being this kind of two-spirit figure is so such a obvious kind of thing to me. <laughs> you know, that not just to me personally, but within you know various indigenous traditions and being the trickster and all of these kinds of things. It's just. Um, I, I, I sometimes really bemoan the fact that, that you know, transgender folk are not getting access to these ideas, which really have to do with really um, a, a great calling, potentially, not in every person, but some, you know. So I'm interested in that. Yes. Well, I guess, um, I don't think I could think this way if I weren't queer. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I always, I always think that because um, uh, what you didn't see is that before this woman gets well, she has to go through a lot of um, assaults. But she also tells the story of um, herself um, uh, publicly um, rejecting um, this uh, out Chicana lesbian who was, had been this communist activist, incredible woman who was murdered. Um, uh, God, I think she was murdered in the, in the 80s. And that she tells the story of realizing that she was queer, knowing she was queer th the whole time, and that's why she talked bad about this woman, right? And that with this woman's murder, she vowed that she would never, ever be quiet again about anything and came out, right? So in order for her to get well, she has to admit her betraying her own kind, right? So had you seen that part, that would have you know, been clear to you. But I think um, it, uh, my first question is really probably, I mean, my first response, I think, is really the truer response, that I feel like, yes, you know, I always kind of, and, and, and the thing about the goyote, I figure, you know, the, the, the person in me that would cast that as a woman and also cast those men to be the, viola the a female to be the violators, um, is a very queer response. You know, I, I, um, I'm not quite sure what queer is, I just know when I think <laughs> it's usually queer. No, I'm saying, so, you know, what I'm saying is I'm not trying to be facetious, is that really and truly, you know, I have also, um, yeah, you know, that the, it, it's, it's dangerous because it's both literal in the sense of what is your sexuality and how you look at gender. But I also feel like as I grow older um, and, and this case of like looking at even that Medea figure who's ostensibly, you know, heterosexual for most of her life until she gets with this woman, but even, but her illness, I mean her crime, not her illness, her crime in Atzlan was queer before she even came out. Because my, my growing definition of queer, sometimes I think there's a lot of really straight queer people, uh, especially with all of the kind of domestication of our movement. You know, that's another two hour conversation, but you know, I'm concerned about the edge in our movement being lost. Everybody wants to be good citizens. I find that um, counterintuitive <laughs> because if you have a big critique of the of citizenship, you know, then there's que I have questions about being members. Um, so that's queer. So I really experience a lot of lesbian and gay people not very queer. 
I have also, con I have also experienced women of color who ostensibly were heterosexual in their lives, and many of them are dead now, who were actually not queer in the sense that they were not lesbian. But they're some of the queerest women I ever met, and that's why they're not alive to this day. And so my interest really has to do with that kind of queerness, you know, which is not common, which is why when I mentioned the thing about um, the transgender thing about that vision of being transgender that, it, that is, uh, that has so much to offer, you know, that's really queer. And uh, it's a hard road to walk. And that's the function of queerness. It is not an easy road. And if it were easy, man, it wouldn't be queer. You know, I mean, that's, and there's always been a, that's why you have to maintain and support those people that are doing that hard work. And for women of color, the cost is very great. So in the student level, that's when my first response was, was is closer, I think, to what I mean. But thank you for the question. It's a really good one. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being here. And, and um, honestly, thank you for staying on the planet, because I'm thinking about um, when I first saw you speak was probably around 92 at Women of Color Conference at Berkeley. Um, and it was an, and you spoke in honor. You know, Audrey Lorde had just passed, and you, and you gave a talk about that. And I, listening to your talk and watching this piece, I was thinking actually a lot about Tony K. Bambara, um, the salt eaters, are you sure you want to be well? Mm -hmm. And that's all, about, that's all about a choice and about memory, right? Mm -hmm. You know? She's that one of the sisters I think of when, um, when I think of yeah. those women of color, she's on my list. Right, and we yeah. lost Barbara Christian since yeah. then too. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about um, how, I would love to hear you speak more about staying on the planet, you know, and, 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 and choosing wellness and choosing to remember. Um, I know you're already speaking about that, but I just want to kind of draw all that together. Well, I mean, I think it's a, you know, um, you know, a certain level um, to say, you know, I'm glad you're still on the pl planet. Thank you very much. But, but, and one thinks, well, we shouldn't have to think that you know, with a 58-year-old woman. You shouldn't have to, that shouldn't cross your mind. But it does. Yes, because of all of the, um, you know, incredible women that, you know, diabetes, cancer, you know, all of those things, high blood pressure, I mean, all of it. And, the, and, and I don't even, not just that also, but also women, and those are the casualties that are not spoken about, that have kind of lost their minds you know, sisters, you know, that, you know, went through menopause and everybody thought they were crazy, but it's because they didn't have access, you know, to the same kind of health care and the same kind of support systems that, that other women had. And, you know, I think, I mean, I knew women coming up that were, you know, that were writers, artists, visionaries, serious sisters, you know, Puerto Rican Socialist Party, that it and feminists, I mean, doing the impossible because they're older than me. And they're like barely hanging together or they're gone already, you know. So it, it really what we're talking about, you know, is, you know, when you're talking about bridge, okay, we're talking about the, multi you know, the multiple oppressions. And it translates into not being well. And it's very hard to be well. And that's why I started this, you know, my health isn't great all the time. But, it, you know, but it's, but, you know, there's a, I started this thing by saying about what it is to be able to look across the table and, and to have familia, you know, on your own terms, on your own terms. And I, and I feel like that does everything about securing some kind of health. We're very lucky if we get it, and we usually don't, you know, because particularly if you're um, a heterosexual woman of color and, and have all of that vision and everything, it's very hard to find companionship, you know, that kind of companionship um, in terms of making family, you know. We also suffer, and I have to say, we suffer an enormous amount, those of us who have children or who have raised children. I, I cannot, I never would have known the degree to which having children can break you or raising children can break you, you know, because you're raising them in a culture that, fights you every inch of the way. 
it is impossible virtually. And you know, for my part, I figure I feel like if I'm gonna last, but I have to figure out a way, and I'm get my Buddhist trip together because I have to figure out detach, you know, let go, let go. And I, I've written a lot about that, not only with you know raising children, but also with the dying, how to let go of, you know, those who pass on. And you know, my relatives are all, you know, they've all practically gone now, and uh, they lived long lives. But but so you know, living in the world of of the dying for a long time, you know, all of these are things that raise your blood pressure, you know, <laughs> and are not healthy. So, but I think it's something like when I was talking about the thing about patriarchal motherhood, I've never had a conversation about patriarchal motherhood within a Latina context in my life, ever. And what does it even mean? You know, that's why those see what the tail are so fierce to me, <laughs> you know. Um, how do you take back control of how we mother? But you can't take control of how you mother if the society, you know, is opposing you at every inch. That's why you need solidarity. That's why you need movement, which it brings us back to the body. And people don't get it that, you know, it's like movement means there's bodies not behind screens that are interacting with each other, making community, making movement, creating solidarity so you're not alone in your need. You know, and, and I think for women of color in particular, it's very difficult for us to do that for all the obvious reasons. You know, just talking about all the multiple oppressions. You and then you. I'm sorry, whatever hell you want to do it, I want to make you run. Uh, thanks. I, hi, Sherry. I'm Laura Esquivel. Our paths have crossed many, many years ago. Um, it, it's really wonderful to, as the, as the sister said, see you still here on the planet and get to hear you. Igualmente. Um, I, I have been, I have a question, totally different tact, about, about writing. Uh, I've been encouraged for for years to write my memoirs, and I think, ah, oh, no, it's not, you know, it's just my story, it's not really anything special, you mm -hmm. know, I, I came out 36 years ago, and uh, had a, a baby as a lesbian mother 32 years ago, you know, before mm -hmm. it was fashionable, right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it's, um, there aren't a lot of stories like that, you know, but I went to a workshop last night with this, this writer at the Kennedy School, where I'm at right now, He's won a Pulitzer series, won a National Book Award. I, don't, I didn't learn shit from him. <laughs> I learned more tonight listening to you talk about writing. And um, I just, I don't know, not advice, but I don't know, some reaffirmation that the story's important. Yeah. Well, you know, I would, the, that's the story right there, you know. I mean, the beauty of our, uh, you know, the beauty of our, um, bodies, you know, is that whatever at that moment that you want to cry, you like that, that's the story, and that's where you begin. Nothing else matters, and partly all of the stuff that people say you should write your memoir and everything, those are the people you forget about. And you don't even, I mean, if, you know, I, I'm saying this, you know, you know, as a, as a, you know, with respect, that what the process is, is that you have to forget all of that, and whatever, whatever, whatever causes you to have that rise up in you, and you said that it's, in, you know, is it even important? Well, it, really, that's a question to ask yourself, right? So, so the writing is very private in the initial stages. It's so, I mean, you may already be doing this, but, but I just feel like the only time I've ever gotten to anything que vale algo is because I always pretend I'm not gonna publish it. I always pretend, and it's really a pretending because, you know, usually it gets published, you know, but, but I really, but I pretend for a long time. I may pretend for years, you know, because the minute you start thinking of how they're perceiving it, you've lost that, which just, that's your great, that's a great beginning right there. And of course it's worth it, you know. If it's worth it to you, I mean, if, they, if somebody's making, wanting you to do something because they want you to do it, well, don't, don't do it. But clearly you have a story to tell, you know. And the fact you even said, I did it 30-something years ago, and, you know, it's like that's the story right there. 
you know, that, 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 that young woman and, and having compassion for her. I mean, partly, I've only written memoirs about when I'm motivated about a specific reason. You know, I don't feel like I'm old enough to write a memoir. I mean, I feel that, you know, my, your life story. Really what it's about is, again, the specificity. What is that kernel of something you want to tell? And in the act of telling that story, you'll end up telling volumes of many other things. I mean, I had started with, you know, my mother's Alzheimer's, just seeing her go that way. Our premier storyteller. And that, watching that story ended up, I'm writing all kinds of stuff I never imagined. But it stays, it stays kind of awake, I think, because of staying close to that initial impetus, you know, and not really worrying about, because people weren't, you know, when, I, when my agent sent it out, they go, oh, you know, another Alzheimer's story, we've been there, done that, you know. And I love that they said that, because it pissed me off so much that it made me really want to go back to my book, you know. Anyway, so good luck to you. I'm sure you, you're right there. Yes, somebody raised your hand, yeah. First of all, thank you for um, for bringing the experience of ceremony to um, to the stage in in such an honoring way. Um, I, it feels like a sort of an area that that a lot of or or a ceremony, a specific ceremony, and kind of work that so few people are familiar with. And so to offer that kind of visceral experience, I think. Um, opens a lot of doors for people to, to enter into the work in their own capacities. Um, but I, what, I, what I'm hoping you might say more about is, um, is this sort of cross-cultural upsurgence in um, work with medicines, um, be that peyote or San Pedro or ayahuasca, um, as an attempt to sort of um, hear the body, reconnect to the body, and, and what's more, connect to um, the wounds of our ancestors which we have inherited and, and the context of our own experience in something so much greater um, than ourselves. So, um, yeah. Um, well, I have to say I have, um, and I think this would also apply to uh, kind of a whole movement of, of um, a lot of folks um, getting involved in, in the Yoruba tradition as well. Um, Santeria, you know, various aspects of the Yoruba tradition. Um, and, I, and I see within our own communities, you know, the medicine ceremonies are really, you know, strong. I mean, important, you know. And I have a lot of, you know, critique about it. And, uh, my critique is not, is, is I, you know, I, I think that it's appropriate in, in many ways for Chicanos to be doing this because it is our medicine. Um, and the same way, you know, in the Yoruba tradition, seeing so many African American women get involved, you know, it is, it's a related tradition. And not that I'm, and I'm not saying that non, those, you know, if you're not that, you can't do it. But I do worry a, a lot about, for example, in the case of ayahuasca, more so than even peyote, that it's now like a worldwide phenomenon. You can go on the website and sign up for it and pay money and you know do all of this. And I just, you know, I, that I think the most important question that one has to ask themselves and relate to, and related to spirit work is that if it can be commodified, there ain't no God there. That's all I know to be true. So us as individuals, when we enter into those settings, we have to, we have to know ourselves whether God there. I mean, like you say, and I say, God, I mean, did, did spirit happen? And if it didn't happen, why didn't it happen? We can't be fools, you know. In, it's just like we're talking about raising your kids, you know, in a world where everything is commodified. You know, how do you help people develop an internal life? How do you teach a child, you know, that it's not about competition? So it's, it's the same kind of phenomenon. I, I worry over it because everybody's looking for quick, you know, the quick road. And the truth of it is with any kind of ceremony, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but 
you know, I go to ceremony, I'm done for six months. I'm so wiped out because it matters. And I see my young estudiantes and they're like every weekend another peyote ceremony. I'm going, dang, man, how do they do it? Because it's work. If it's, if it's really work, you don't show up every weekend. Because supposedly what the medicine has to teach you should send you back to work and you shouldn't even have to come back again unless you didn't finish your work. So maybe you come a few years later or maybe you come five years later. You, but this idea that, you know, you know, that some, then it's like a high. So I have a lot of critica and a lot of concerns, but I also know that the phenomenon also represents, and this is also among African-American women, Caribbean women, et cetera, it also, and men, it also does, though, represent everybody's, I mean, a kind of growing need for spirit practice, you know? But it, it, it's like you don't get well without suffering. And I'm not talking in the Catholic way. But if it hurt to get there, it hurts to get well. It's simple as that. Nine's early. <laughs> you better be committed. Nine o'clock. Cherry, gracias. Sí, Thank you so much. Um, you know, there's all kinds of healings. And I don't know if you can perceive it in this room, but there's a lot of us struggling. And there's a lot of us looking for healing. And there's a lot of us forming communities of choice, families of choice in order to support each other on this journey, on this road. Um, we were talking last night, and you mentioned something about, you know, when you are the one writing, uh, and you identify with that particular tradition, it's almost not appreciated. It's almost like, oh, it's easy for you to do Latina studies because you're Latina, or it's easy for you to talk about, you know, queer indigenous people because that's what you are. And then when someone who doesn't identify as such goes and publishes the book and gets <laughs> all the credit, you know, um, it's, it's, it's something, you know, it's really something to have hope. It's really something to keep going. It's really something to have courage um, to write those stories because they matter. To write those stories no matter how many times they've been told before. It needs to be heard again and you never know who's going to pick up that book and who's going to read that last line of that play. Um, and I just wanted to thank you, but also to ask you um, to give us a word, to give us a word of hope, to give us a word of healing. I know you've already given us tons of them, but I want to hold this space in a ritual manner right now because I know there are a lot of us hurting. There are a lot of us lost or about to be lost or thinking that we're lost or having people turn off the light so we can be lost. And I just want to hold this space right now and, and ask you, because you are in that borderlands, because you inhabit those two worlds, the theater, performance, poetry, uh, the oral tradition, but you're also in academia and you also have to fight those demons. You also have to fight that institutional practice of silence. Um, would you offer us ritually now a word of hope? Well, I think that's just what I did. I mean, I don't know, I don't know any other, any other way. I mean, it's like people always say to me, why do you write tragedy? I said, because it's so damn hopeful. Because there is no way for a wound to be healed unless you open it. Otherwise it gets scabbed over and it festers and, you know. So, um, you know, the, I, I think if you're talking about a particular um, uh, struggle in relationship to the academy, 
Um, I think I would um, go back to what I opened up with is that um, it's to know the difference, you know, really, what's the us and them. If you keep clear about what your needs are and what your intentions are, you have to remember what your intention is. And in the, I, I always, as like I was saying about being at Stanford, and I've told her I've had some really, a real hard time at Stanford. Um, but I always, I wake up every morning and I thank, you know, the powers that be that I have a J-O-B so I can E-A-T, you know. And, and in a certain level, again, that's what we're talking about the ego, so you need to have um, resilience to be able to use the academy and not be used by it. Um, but f and the way you have that is that you know the difference between us and them. And so you do what they tell you to do so you can get through. And to the degree that you can do it. And if you can't do it, then you do what you can do. And the truth of the matter is, if they don't want it, and you can't do otherwise, you out. But I'm not, that, that shouldn't make you not hopeful. Because, I mean, I'm just talking in the broader, you know, broader scheme of things. Because if what you want to do, and you line up everybody to help you be that and do that in this university and all your labor and everything else, you know, and I, and I hope, you know, that you, it's like some people can compromise do it and get out. Other people can, I'm one of those people, right? I just couldn't, I didn't, I couldn't, all right? But I never tried to do a PhD anyway, but about other things. But let me tell you an example, just to get my master's degree, I was working on this bridge called my back and I went to my, um, my professors, my committee, just to get a master's degree, no big deal. And I went to them and I said, I'm working on this book and uh, I want this book to be my, my thesis. And they said, well, that's not what your initial intention was. I said, yeah, I know, I changed. I said, that's what your education, it was feminist studies, what your education is supposed to be. I was supposed to change, well, I changed, and this is ultimately, this is where I'm going. This is what now, and I said to them, I'm not bragging or anything, I'm scared, you know, and I said to them, if I can't do that, then I won't get a master's degree. Because I knew that all that I wanted was there that that was going to be the beginning of something really important. And if someone made me waste my time, I couldn't. So I was willing not to get the master's degree. Luckily, they said okay. Another point, Stanford University. I was supposed to go for my rehire. I'm, I'm hired on these five-year five, five year intervals. I go to have my interview with my chair. Chair looks at me and says, you know, we really like, you know, the people you bring into your classes, but we really want, um, we'd really like you to get those people to come into the rest of the drama department. So when he says that to me, my heart starts pounding. Again, the body, right, my heart starts pounding. I said, oh no, he wants me to integrate the department. And I thought to myself, mortgage, you know, kids, grandkids, I mean, all this is going through my head. And I thought, oh, well, this, you know, so I say to him, you're asking me to integrate your department. He goes, well, I would, you know, it was, you know, so I wouldn't put it that way, but yeah, you know, and I said, the thing of it is, is that your department has nothing for them that they're interested in. You're talking about people of color, and it's a very Eurocentric department, less so now, but at those times it was more. And I said, my, and particularly Chicanos, Latinos. And I said, it, it, it has nothing for them, so I can't, I can't offer them something, what has to happen is the department has to change in order there to be something for them. They're coming to my classes because it's what they want. And I said, and if they're good, if they're a good actor, whatever, I said, I try to get them to go in to get acting classes and all that. I said, but, you know, they're not gonna go unless it's, you know, culturally home for them and it feels alienating. Now, I'm saying this in a real simple way, but the whole time I'm talking to him, my heart is pounding, I think he's going to fire me. I can't tell you what the stakes were like because I know he didn't like me, you know? And I thought, okay, I'm gonna lose my job. So I go home 
And I say, okay, let's put the house on the market, man, that's the only thing we got. So it's like, that goes, because I can't keep the house and not have the job. Two times, and the second time, so, so I got to do my master's the way I wanted, and I, and I kept my job. Now, I don't know if I'll get it two years from now again. I think they like me less now, you know? But the point of it is, on a certain level, and I mean this, and, I, and it doesn't, you know, push to get exactly what you want all the way. Get your allies lined up, get what you want, you know, and compromise if you want the degree. If you are willing to not get the degree because you don't have a choice, it's not a choice, you can't do it, you can't roll over for them, you can't, then you can't, it's not a choice, you can't. And I swear to Jesus, another door will open up for you. And I don't just mean you personally. I'm saying this for all of us. Our road, God, how beautiful. We have a life. We have a life. You know? And I know people that they were in your very position and that happened and they have a life. You know? And who knows what it would have happened. I, I, you know, not for just you, you, I'm saying. I hope you all work this hard to get your PhDs. I hope so because it's too damn hard for that not to happen. You know, but the truth of the matter is, is that if a person can't compromise, a person can't compromise, and the institution is, is requiring you to compromise, well then, there you go. Was that totally not hopeful? There you go. 